Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Robert Pellard. I'm the acting vice chancellor here at the University of Reading. Uh, it gives me great pressure to welcome you to Henry Business School this evening. Um, and especially uh, pleasing to see this interesting mix uh, of ages, all I've just commented on it, students, alumni, and those of you who live nearby, and, and uh, our friends of the university, all very welcome. Um, just a quick note, tonight's proceedings will be filmed, and they can be watched uh, in live stream, so there are, uh, there are cameras around, and I would always say, so, you know, if you don't want to be seen on camera, don't um, back at the front, they don't want to see you, that's the best way to do it. And it's my great honor to introduce uh, our guest speaker this evening, Paul Lindley. Now, now Paul has an, has an incredible rich uh, biography, so I hope you don't mind that I do look at my notes a bit, just to make sure I introduce him properly. So Paul is an award-winning entrepreneur, social campaigner and author. In 2006, frustrated by the lack of healthy food available for his own young children, uh, and concerned about the growing levels of childhood obesity in the UK, Paul launched Alice Kitchen, an organic uh, baby food company, which is now the UK's largest food, baby food brand and sells in over 40 countries across the world. In 2013, Paul sold, sold the company to Haynes Celestial and fully stepped away in 2018 to spend more time pursuing other interests, particularly social campaigning. Paul is chair of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights UK and a trustee of Sesame Workshop, the creators of Sesame Street. He sits on the board of social enterprise Toast Ale uh, and has been a councillor at One Young World and director of Blue After Bite the book No Bella. And I'm sure all the, all the things I'm just saying will probably feature some of them in the talk when we go along. He's also the co-founder alongside uh, South Sydney's ex-child soldier and award-winning hip-hop artist in Manuel Jow of the Key is E, which he uses education and entrepreneurship to empower and engage Africa's brightest social entrepreneurs to build businesses that improve children's lives. And in March of this year, Paul took on a new challenge when he was appointed chair of the London Child Obesity Task Force. I was appointed by the Mayor of London, Steve Carr. And the, uh, the task force is an organization which aims to combat the epidemic of childhood obesity across the capital. Now, Paul has received many awards for his professional achievements, including Entrepreneur of the Year in 2011. He was awarded an honorary degree by the University of Reading in 2013. He remains strongly affiliated to us here at the university. Uh, playing an active role as a senior ambassador for our Imagine uh, fundraising and volunteering campaign, and collaborating closely with us on a future event, including Imagine If, an innovation company, sorry, an innovation competition designed to identify business ideas that will benefit society. Last year, Paul published his first book, they critically acclaimed Little Wins, the huge power of thinking like a toddler. I know Paul is going to talk about it. I have my copy, and you can purchase yours either before or after the lecture. It's good, good for a <coughs> uh, I will do for you for 9.99, and I think Paul will be around to, to sign if um, if you are inspired by his lecture today. Um, I have no doubt you will find Paul fascinating, um, and you will you will want to hear from him and not from me. So without further ado, Paul, can I invite you? Ladies and gentlemen, can we invite Paul? Society, as much about teaching uh, academia, is helping our young people be part of the society, and helping us all in the community where the university is, and I think uh, Reading excels at that. Um, thank you. Um, hopefully, uh, you're in the right lecture, and hopefully, you've read a little bit about what it's around, and you might see little wins and think this guy is going to talk uh, a little bit about how the little wins can come in our lives from sort of small changes that we can make make uh, small changes to have big change in our lives. And that is a little win. There's lots of little steps 
that I will touch on. That's kind of the backstory of what I want to say. Um, but the second part, and it's like little comma wins, is little people win, in my view. And what I'm going to try and persuade you is that the people that are our heroes, the people we should look up to, are not the big politicians and the big business leaders and those really serious people um, that are managing our world at the moment, but the little people. The little people we all once were. The five-year-olds we once were. That's what I'm going to try and persuade you in this next 40 minutes or so. Um, and I'm going to try and leave you, that's my challenge, leave you thinking 1% differently than you have when you come in now. And I think it will add a lot more than 1% to the way you look at your life, uh, your work, our society. That's my little challenge. And you can, you can challenge me in questions afterwards if I fail to do that. Now, you may already have got an opinion of who I am. Uh, from that, that, that introduction, that kind of introduction there, but also from my sort of graying hair and my very untrendy stubble and, and the sort of clothes that I'm wearing, and you might decide, okay, this is who this guy is, and I'm going to tell you you're exactly wrong, because the person that I am is this person. <laughs> this is who is living right inside of me on this stage now, and it's the person that has helped me on the journey that Robert um, described just now. Uh, and, you know, I, that photo was taken, I remember that was a bright blue um, little suit, and that nappy was definitely full. <laughs> and I just learned to throw a ball at that moment there, and I was so proud to show my dad my new skill, and I was living in the moment. I had no idea what was coming in the next 10 minutes or the next 40, 50 years, and I'd forgotten what I was doing sort of 10 minutes ago. I was absolutely living in the moment to show my dad how uh, his photograph was turned out, and that's what... That's a very simple early example of what toddlers do fantastically and what we tend not to do as adults. We tend to worry about the future or live in the past and not enjoy the moment, as I'm clearly enjoying there. I've got this free thinking, this imagination, this self-confidence about myself that I can just throw this new skill that I, I've just got. And what that's important to me, and we all may have similar stories, but why that is important now to this lecture is because I think that is the reason why our business that I created and our team helped build has been so successful. Because we have built into the DNA of that company the absolute values that it lives by, uh, a, a value of childlike, to be childlike. Uh, whether the people we recruit, how we promote them, how we reward them, to be childlike with that imagination and that free thinking is what we challenged ourselves. And as you know, that company was Ella's Kitchen. It is still Ella's Kitchen. And, and you've heard, um, it, it, you know, very proud that it's a very local company. It started from uh, our kitchen uh, in Cavisham uh, and has grown to 70 or 80 people now that still live in, uh, and work uh, in Reading and South Oxfordshire. And um, I can tell you so much about Ellis Kitchen, and I won't, because any business leader shouldn't talk about what their company is. They should let their customers talk about what their company is. And I'm privileged that our customers are toddlers, my heroes. So I've got this little guy here whose dad decided to film this and put it on to YouTube. And it's the exact sort of thing that we couldn't have paid um, advertising money to create. Uh, if the dad puts it on for 20 minutes, like you, you, you've got 20 seconds, but you can press repeat and the, the same thing will happen for the next 20 minutes. So let's see what they think about Ella's Kitchen. Let me start with something else that makes a lot of sense. I don't go, you So, Ellis Kitchen doesn't sell baby food, it sells emotion, it sells stimulation of all the senses, and that's why it's one of the reasons why it's successful. And over the years, um, I've been asked so much to be on a panel, stand on the stage, and sort of give words of wisdom about why it's been successful, and I've said all sorts of different things over the time, but my, the thing I've concluded is everything that I've said is really about an ability to look through eyes as though everything in the world was brand new as we all in this room once did. And that is the skill that we had. And I, I, I'll give you some examples along the way of why I think that's true. I'll start kind of generically. Let's pick some entrepreneurs. Um, one from the 1930s, very famous person still now, and his most uh, iconic sort of quote was, his view was the most, uh, in, the most valuable thing in the world is in the minds of our children. And he decided to draw a mouse on the back of that, and then he created some films, and he created a theme park, and we all go to Disneyland now, wanting to rediscover, with our children, 
are you? Because he just looked through the eyes of the child, and it still works only 100 years later. And in modern, right now, um, it, it, I think Richard Branson is the, it's me, who very kindly forwarded my book, of uh, thinking like a toddler, which is, let's not conform. Nobody can tell me exactly how to, to do it, because I think there's a different way of doing it. And for 30, 40 years <coughs> now, he's created different businesses. He's been had to fail, which we all did as toddlers all the time, and we learn from that failure and adapt and grow. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But I've just picked two people who I think think like toddlers. Let's go a step further. Let's find toddlers who have created businesses. And the first one is this little girl here, who's, who's uh, a blonde girl. Um, and in the 1950s, uh, she went on holiday with her parents and uh, got all excited and they took photographs of each other. And she asked her dad, why can't I see the pictures that we've just taken? And he said, no, no, we need to wait till we get home, and then we go to kind of boots, and then he comes back, and we'll, we'll see them in a month's time. And she didn't understand why this should be so. And he then thought, why is this so? So he went off, and he created, over the next couple of years, the Polaroid camera. And by, within 10 years, every second household in America had a Polaroid camera. And by the 1970s, over a billion photographs were being taken a year on Polaroid cameras, which was different than everything else had ever been, because a little girl asked a question that no adult had thought to ask before. And someone acted upon it. And then in that decade, in the 1970s, a little boy asked his dad what a tickle looked like. And his dad was a bit of an artist and drew a tickle. And the little boy coloured it in. And then they went on to other emotions. And they created the Mr. Men book, which to date now have sold 120 million copies. They're in 40 different languages all sorts of franchises and licenses and things, because that little boy asked that question. And he was a toddler and thought like a toddler. And now I've picked, I've researched them and found them, but I didn't need to research this next one, because when I was creating Ella's Kitchen, we had some ideas of what our first products would be, and I put them on our kitchen table, a little island, and I asked my kids <coughs> and their friends to say which one they liked best. And my son straight away said, I like the red one, red like my fire engine. That was his rationale. And he pointed at it, and they sort of tasted it, and they all agreed that was the one. And uh, I thought, right, we'll go with that. That's consumer research. And then I thought in the evening, he called it the red one. We should call it the red one, because that's the way a toddler thinks. And for Ellis Kitchen now, that is their iconic uh, product. It's the bestseller. Uh, the logo is from that product, and, and, uh, and, and it epitomized the company, because a toddler thought like that. So if I haven't convinced you yet, and that wasn't enough to write a book around. I thought I need to do some research. Is there really science in thinking like a toddler? What if that we lose? So I went to research, and um, the person I'll share with you now is Sir Ken Robinson, who some of you may know um, uh, delivered the most ever watched TED talk, which is Do Schools Kill Creativity? And it's been watched more than any other thing. And he, he's an expert in children's development. And he did a little bit of research after that TED talk uh, around divergent thinking, which is the ability to switch from thinking about something to the next thing, thinking about something else, and, and forgotten what you've thought about before. And Todd was excited about this, and it's a sign, a measure, actually, of creativity. And I can tell you that from that research, that us here, because we were once three, four, or five years old, 98% of us in this room thought divergently because we got through our day. So 98% of us were creative. And for those of us who are over 25, 2% of us think creatively, think divergently as we get through our day. That's what Robinson found out. Which means that 96% of us lose creativity. It was there in the world, and now we don't use it to get through our day. That's a huge loss. Because creativity breeds ideas, and ideas can change the world. So if instead of only 2% of us at 25 and beyond being creative, if 4% of us Doubling. Does that double the amount of ideas and, and solving our world's problems in the world by being creative? That's a doubling, that's big. But it might only be 96% of us lose creativity rather than 98. And maybe if we parented differently and we educated differently and we had our corporate systems that rewarded failure as much as success and that allowed risk to happen, then maybe we find those ideas. Because we all had, once had them when we were toddlers. So I put those things together and I thought, I'll write a book for entrepreneurs starting businesses about how you think of, like a toddler. And, and the publisher turned around to me and said, that's a great idea. However, you're missing a whole audience because everybody was once a toddler. And everybody faces things new. They want to conquer challenges. And they want to find out how to do things and improve themselves. 
So there's a market for everybody. And you can go, and you can, the people that are returning to work after a long time, they get the confidence that they once had as a toddler to return to work, and students, and people that are retiring, and, and all of that. So I thought, okay, we'll write it in, in that style. And that's what I did. And what I'd like to take you on uh, now is this little journey of how to read the book, really, but how we're going to go the next half an hour in this lecture. And that is, I'm going to indulge you. You're not just going to listen to me. I'm going to ask you to do something now, and that is, I'm going to encourage you to grow down, to be that person you once were when you were five years old. And we're going to do that with a couple of little things. I'm going to try, and I'll give you some examples of how I've done it. But first of all, I'm going to ask you to open up that wicker box that's just landed on your laps now and have a rummage in it, because in there are dressing up clothes, play clothes, that you, your children, your grandchildren, have used at some point, and you used to love, and you used to put on, and you became somebody that you might not be, or might want to be, and it gave you a safe place to play, and try things. And we, we, we as adults don't really do that. So run it around there, and find something that you wouldn't ordinarily wear, and, and, and sort of put it on in your head. And uh, that's what I'm going to do, because I've obviously cheated, I know what I was going to say, and I'm going to tell you that when I was a little boy, I wanted to be a pop star. And I wanted to hold the microphone and belt the songs out, and the fact that uh, 50 years later I know I can't sing, and everybody else knows I can't sing, I'm going to return to that now, because I'm going to put my little uh, dressing up thing on, and I am going to be this gentleman. <laughs> okay? And now, with this mask behind me, I'm not frightened of you guys anymore, by the way, but I now think I can sing again, and I can be who I want to be. And we all did this, so hopefully you're beginning to feel now with whatever you put on, that you're feeling like you can try things that ordinarily you might be embarrassed about by. Now, that's the first bit. The second bit, we're going to go a little bit deeper, because I'm going to, if you're brave enough, I'm going to close your eyes, but you can look at the ceiling or something, and I'm going to try and ask you to remember something from either your own childhood or your children or your grandchildren's childhood that is seminal in your mind, that is some really strong family moment. It could be funny, it could be happy, but it's that strong moment. And I'm going to ask you to think not just of the picture in your head of that, but the, all of your senses. So you can smell fire maybe, or hear laughter, or taste food that was from that moment. Because I think by doing that, by stimulating all of your senses out of this lecture theatre, you will be able to get back to a feeling that you had when you were five years old. And again, I'll give you a little example from my son, the same one who, who liked fire engines. Um, when he was four, he just started school, as they do, and then he came back in the second week from school, and he said, Daddy, 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 my new friend Natalie has a boiled egg in her lunchbox every day. I said, brilliant, right? And he said, well, she opens it by banging it on her head. <laughs> Why don't we do this? Why haven't we lived? So I said, if you want to live, let's do it. Let's go tomorrow with a boiled egg. So we, should we try it? So we went to the kitchen, he sat on a little island, I got some eggs out of the fridge, I boiled an egg, I turned around and, and, and cooled it down in the tap, and I turned around and I gave him the other egg that I'd taken out, and I went, oh, that's true. So he picks it up and he bangs it on his head and the yellow goes down his face. And you know with the toddlers and kids when it goes quiet for like five seconds and you think it's five minutes and are they going to cry or laugh? And luckily he chuckled and he just said, you tricked me. And I fell off my chair, and he did, and we laughed away, and I can tell you, even though I was just starting a business, and I had spreadsheets that didn't balance, and phone calls, difficult phone calls, and anything, for that next few minutes, I was a toddler there. And I can remember the steam from the, the, uh, the, the, the cooker, and I remember he was wearing a Reading football club top, and incredible lunchbox was on the side. And I can find that moment for me now, that is that moment where I am a toddler again. And I, I, by doing that, and I go, you haven't got that yet, think about it on the way home. But I think when you get there, you can just imagine stuff that may be true, maybe not true. It's all in your head and it's true to you. But that's how we lived as toddlers, because we didn't know the rules, we didn't have to conform, and our mind could go wherever it wanted. So I'm going to ask you now, this is where you participate, um, because you're all five years old, and you're all happy with that imagination. And I'm going to ask you what this is for, because you can't write. You've seen it in the house, it's on a desk, it's on the kitchen table, and people use it. But why do they use it? Who's brave enough to tell me why they use it? Drawing on the fridge. Drawing on the fridge. Okay, great stuff. Somebody else? Drawing on my face. Drawing on your own face, okay. Casting a spell. Casting a spell, okay, we're getting there, okay? What about this thing? Six, 
in the corner and it buzzes when you turn it on and shakes. Why is that there? You put the dog inside. <laughs> Have you got a dog anymore? <laughs> the cats, okay. Place to hide, okay, wait, that's great. Were they serving wine outside then? This is better than before. Okay, excellent. Well, that, that's, that's, that's perfect because I can tell you that people have thought, like you've just thought, that have invented some really iconic products, which we use today for a reason they were never invented for. So cornflakes that we enjoy in our breakfast every morning were not invented to be this delicious breakfast that you put milk on in the morning. Uh, Play-Doh, safety matches, microwave ovens, Viagra, penicillin, potato chips, a whole load of things that somebody along the way, either the inventor or the person that found them by accident, or a customer along the way, said, oh, this is a better way to use it. And they're kind of thinking like toddlers, as we've just thought, because who's to say there's not a better way to use a washing machine? So I sort of thought there's this whole load of skills that we had at five years old that we must have thought then. Bloody brilliant, isn't it? Because I'm four or five years old, the last two years, I've learned to smile, to walk, to talk, and to play. I'm five, and I'm going to live till 85. So what else is to come now? All these skills I'm going to just amplify and add to. And the sad fact is that many of those things we don't use anymore. We either think we're childish, or we're too busy to use those skills or to recognize that we want to learn so much from them. So I'm going to use these four stages that we all went through to show you some skills that I think we can improve our personal development and our self-worth uh, and our self-fulfillment uh, in our jobs and in our personal lives and for our society by using more. So I think learning to smile, when we did that, we, we moved our mouth in, in a certain way and we were created with muscles we hadn't used before and then people smiled back at us and we increased the grin and we got confidence. So let's look at those two things that I think toddlers excel at. First of all, confidence. Toddlers live in a very black and white world. And let, you know, we can think about toddlers and grandchildren and kids we see in the park now, but that was us once. We lived in this very same world we're living in now, and we lived in it black and white. We didn't know a lot, we made instinctive decisions more often than not, and we made decisions and we decided we liked the person we would go to them, we didn't like the person we would stand away. Very binary. And we lose that as life gets more complicated. But my proposition is that we should lose inhibitions and worry less, that we should simplify some of our decisions because not every decision we make as an adult is complicated. We tend to prevaricate. There are complicated ones, obviously, that need to think through. But if you believe that a decision is better than no decision, and if you worry about making a decision and therefore make no decision because you worry about the consequences, some of which, many of which you can't control, sometimes it's better to have the confidence to start a journey. I think every entrepreneur will tell you that. The risk that's against them, the statistics are so high they should never start the journey. But they do because they have the confidence and they can bring people with them and they're confident by keeping things simple. And a, a sort of sister of that confidence is creativity. And many of us get really stressed by creativity and say, I'm not creative. Well, 98% no, of us were. But if you think about creativity, just in the ability to ask questions, ask why for everything, which toddlers do all the time, and then question the answers. Question convention. Because I don't think there's any one way to do anything. I think if I was giving this lecture in America and you asked me how to spell colour, I'd say a different answer than if you asked me right now. And with a decimal point, I can make one plus one equal three. I think there's many ways to get to, to there's not one way to get to, to everything. So, Creativity is about trying different strategies. Trying those two ways to get to the same thing and exploring and discovering and really failing and then learning and adapting. And I can amplify those two things with uh, this, this story of, uh, back, back in school again, a lady who had taught reception year for 25 years. She knew exactly what to do. The first day kids turn up at age four in September, she does the same thing every year, 25 years. It works all the time sit them all down and ask them to draw somebody that they love. They will all go quiet, they'll draw around and she can get to know them. And she can get to know their families because they all thought their families. So she walks around this one year, time, <coughs> year and she sees mums and dads and nanas and granddads and dogs and cats and things, and she sees this girl that she's drawing that she hadn't, doesn't recognise. She says to the little girl, what is it? And the little girl said, it's God. And I love God. 
And she goes, wow, I haven't seen that before, but, but nobody knows what God looks like. And she said, well, they do now. <laughs> and we, how do we know God doesn't look like that? So confidence and creativity both come out of the minds of children, of which we once were and should return to. So then we learn to walk. And it's the first time we can discover the world and get around. And, you know, none of us who had the privilege to walk in here this evening walked the first time we tried. We fell over probably four or five hundred times. And each time we would have got up, we would have bruised our knees, we would cut our lips and cry, and we would have worked out what we did wrong last time, and we will try it a little bit different, and we'll iterate. And then we'll walk, maybe after a couple of months. And for some reason, we get up again after that 399th time, and we say we're going to do it, and we get it all right this time, and we do. And that's sort of ridiculous if you think in a three or four month period to go from a baby who can't move to a toddler that can run around. And so that's obviously instinct, dogs and cats do it as well, but, but we have that determination with us. And that's where I'd like to, to, to go with, with this, this idea of determination and, and ambition. It's because I think, as adults, we should set our goals really, really high and be prepared to miss them. Accept failure. We, we fail most things that we do in our lives, and we certainly did as toddlers. We, we do every day, really, if we care to admit it. But I thought, you know, when, when I ran out of this kitchen, it was, let's aim for the stars, let's fail and get here, because I think if we hadn't aimed for the stars, if we'd aimed here and be all smug with ourselves because we've got here and we all got bonuses that year, we haven't achieved what we could have achieved if we'd aimed much higher. And we tend to conform, and, and the corporate culture rewards a bonus at the end of the year for being successful. And maybe you'd be better as a company if you failed this year, learnt, and done something incredible next year from that learning. The corporate culture doesn't encourage us to do that. But there's no point in aiming high if you're not determined to see it through. And anyone who's had a toddler and tried to put them into a car seat, and they don't want to do it, will know what determination is. And I think we should stay stubborn to our principles and our beliefs, and not, not be transactional and, and, and sort of be quiet when we see that they're being uh, abused. We should keep getting up because we're going to get knocked down far more than we ever do, ever do but get it right. And we should stand our ground when we believe in something. And my book is full of stories within Ellis Kitchen of how we did that. So then is the big point in any parent's life of when your child says their first words. And they begin to communicate and share their thoughts with the world and ask about the world. And that is verbal and non-verbal. So let's see what, that, what skills we learned as we started to do that. The first of all is that when we started to talk, at around two years old for most of us, we didn't know how to tell lies. We learned quite quickly. But at the first few months, up to about three years old, we tell what we see, often disarmingly, as we know. You've got your child on the tube, and the child says to you in a loud voice, that lady's got a fat bottom. And you say, she hasn't. And then you say, Daddy, you said she did it. <laughs> and the story's like that about, and that's a disarming honesty that I think, perhaps with a little bit more subtlety, we should have more in our workplace and in our lives. Because if there are difficult conversations to have been had, they should be done early. It's part of my book where I got to know the former president of South Africa, and I asked him questions about why he, the points he took in his life and why he took them and specifically about how their negotiations with the ANC went and how he formed a relationship with Nelson Mandela. And he said that you know, they got to the end of the negotiations where their teams had walked out, there was violence in the streets, and one of them had to pick up the phone to the other and be really honest about where they could go and where they couldn't go. Maybe there's lessons to learn there for our politicians now. But they, they did it, and they got a trust with each other, and that trust led to a solution. Because they were transparent. They risked exposing what they couldn't do, and uh, that being um, taken advantage of, and built trust. And toddlers do that instinctively for those, that first year. Whoops. OK, so, so 30 seconds a step away from toddlers, just to show how important that is, especially with business. I think the days when businesses can tell lies about what their business stands for or does are gone. You've got Panama Papers, you've got social media, you can, uh, perception is the truth. But it's people like me, and I often talk about how capitalism should be reformed in different sorts of lectures, but it, it epitomizes to me young people like Jesse J, who sing songs about being honest and about how businesses that cheat don't work. And I'll just leave her to give the first four lines of her most famous song. <laughs> So I think back, 
lecture, the person at Volkswagen who decided on a certain day it was going to go into work and it was a great idea to fix those emissions. And take it back to toddlers. If he had children, I'm sure he kissed them good morning and told them to be good at school and phoned his mum in the evening and picked his dog food up and he took it for a walk and all the normal things we all do. But for some reason, whether he had a suit on or whether it was he or she or whatever, decided at work it was okay not to be honest and to cheat. That gets found out, I believe. And we'll increasingly do so in learning toddlers there. Okay, they also get noticed. I can tell you, if Todd joined me on stage now, you wouldn't listen to me at all, whether Todd was saying anything or not, they'd get the attention, and they know how to do that. And any of us who have been lucky enough to have children know that they will want, if they want something, they will approach mum and dad in a different way, because they've thought about it strategically. You know, business leaders would learn so much that, you know, you don't go to Tesco and Sainsbury's and say the same thing. You listen to them first, and that's what they're doing. They don't just go and decide to have a strategy. They've listened to who, where, they, where, which ones are we from what, and how they're going to get their way. And we don't do that enough. We kind of don't think, we, we don't listen before we speak too often. We tell people our opinions, especially around social media, I guess. We've all also got unique stories, every one of us. And toddlers tell them, we can tell stories. We tell toddlers stories, and we don't use stories enough, I don't think. You know, this might be controversial coming to university, but statistics and evidence is one thing, and it can persuade us one way. Emotions are another thing, and uh, we're emotional beings as well as logical beings, and uh, I think stories will help tell them emotions. And so let's make themselves heard as we know. And then finally with this is the sort of non-verbal stuff of, of showing your feelings, which toddlers, again, don't hide. And we in society do all the time. Many men go to work in a suit, and that suit's just like that suit, that suit, that suit, and they all look the same, and they're not expressing their individuality of different people. And so many professions are like that, yet toddlers, if they're angry, they cry and shout and bawl. If they're happy, they shake and they giggle. So making things personal in our personal lives, or in bank corporate lives, of showing when we're happy, showing when we're sad, showing when we're angry, I think works. But the idea that empathy, of which toddlers are often accused of not being empathetic at all, that actually, if a toddler cops onto this discord in the household, they get very upset. But em empathy is a missing skill in our society that we can learn from. And the idea of being purposeful in our lives, why are we here and understanding why we're I think we can learn from showing our feelings and recognizing our own feelings internally. And I'm going to see if I can persuade you to that with this little video, 20 seconds. Uh, I hope you all laugh, but I hope you all also notice that the little girl is very cute, and she's going to see something that she's never seen before in her life. And the dad has seen this thousands of times. Just watch the dad, because he empathises with his daughter, and he'll show his feelings, and we'll have a little conversation about that. Good work, Ray. Hi, Jesus. Hi, tonight, it might not rain tonight, the next time it rains and we're driving, we're kind of annoyed because it's delaying us, why don't we just listen to the windscreen wipers, or, or watch the clouds move, or something that we see every day, that we're blind to every day, like we've never seen it before. Because that father had seen that before, but he wanted to show his daughter that he could see it through new eyes. And in our personal lives, if we've got a problem that we can't solve, why don't we just break our routine a little way? Or in business, we've got a meeting we can't solve, have it in a different place, go to work a different way, then go back the same way and notice things that you don't see before. Challenge us all to go and look at the moon tonight. We will see it, look at it that we've never seen it before. The tops of trees, tops of buildings, all sorts of things that we never see because we're on autopilot. And that world is out there for us to discover. And if we can see things like that in a new life, light, we'll be able to see things that are kind of more personal to us and more difficult for us to um, sort of uh, address in our personal lives. Okay, my final thing is uh, the skill of playing, which toddlers obviously excel at. And I find there's a whole paradox around play, because if you look at it up on Google, play, it will tell you that play is something we do for entertainment or enjoyment, for living in the moment, for no other substantive purpose. And I think that is totally wrong. Because what it really does, when we play, it allows us to explore spatial awareness, communication skills, trial and error. 
collaboration, all those sort of things as we play and get it done. And, uh, you know, there was that time when I'd say we played for a living, and that's what we were doing. We were enjoying the journey, living in the moment, being that, um, thinking, uh, but losing the thought of one thing and moving on to something <coughs> else, uh, and mixing it up. And again, the way when we bring our toddlers home, if we're a parent, we bring them home from the hospital uh, as they're a baby or uh, they have their own room, uh, we spend so much time making sure that it's beautiful and the playroom's there and it's all tidy and it's just for that. Yet so much corporate culture is grey officers with rows of desks that all look the same and nobody's there to have fun. And I think, I know from the company I founded is, if you get people who want to be at work, and fun is part of being at work, they will think about your work and their job and their colleagues' jobs and the responsibilities and the mission that you have when they're walking the dog and having a shower at the weekend and everything. Uh, so create the space to have fun uh, 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 and to, 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 to play. And we often think that play is all for children, and I just analyze, uh, do an analogy to uh, education, which certainly isn't for children. And the final sort of skill that we had when we were uh, toddlers was that we involved others all the time. We all had our best friend, and then we lost that best friend, and it was a new one, and we went back to the first one, and nobody cared. And, uh, and, or if we, if we fell out, we fell out, and we quickly made up. And that sort of teamwork that toddlers learn as they learn to discover the world is vital in our, in our society. In a society where too many of us are living on our own, working on our own, got our iPhone uh, uh, music on all the time, um, and live more solitary than we've ever done before. And we are sort of social being and um, uh, team matters because it helps us find our way through life. And it helps us with chance discoveries. And my God, there's two people, actually Robert mentioned one of them, my friend Emmanuel, who was a child soldier. It's a hip-hop artist. I, I, you know, we were in the same room. We had more... It was easier not to talk to each other than to talk to each other, thinking we'd have nothing in common. We have everything in common. We founded a charity together and we bring around the world together, and um, he just inspires me because he thinks like I don't. So reach out, when it's possible to find, it's easy not to talk to people, talk to them, um, and, and we'll change the world. Now, I think about teamwork um, from a football perspective uh, by looking at two different teams. So we all know that two years ago, in, in England, Leicester won the Premiership, and uh, none of us thought that they would, and none of us still today would say that was the best 11 players that we had in this country best squad in this country. But they got behind a manager, they got behind a mission, they got momentum, they knew their job, they worked as a team to make the best team, and they won the Premier League, and they were the best team in the country. That's true. Let's go back six years before that to World Cup in 2010 in South Africa, when England had this glory generation of players that were coming through. And the bookies had us to be in the final or the semi-final. We were one of the favourites to be there. And we played rubbish, we got knocked out really early, there was a whole load of press criticism of them, and well, I listened to it. And the one piece that I sort of picked up to do with teamwork was a journalist who lived in the hotel with them uh, and watched them come down to breakfast every morning. And they'd come down, and the Man United players would all sit there, and the Arsenal players would sit at the back, and the Chelsea players would sit here, and they'd basically take the piss out of each other. And they weren't a team. And they, there was no way they were going to perform on, 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 the, on the pitch if they weren't performing at the breakfast table. They didn't trust the manager, or they didn't believe in the manager, and they weren't the team. And I was thinking about work, I was thinking, okay, that was my sales team, and that's the operations team, and there's the finance team, and if they don't work together, we're not going to produce a product that works or is at the right time at the right price that people want. And I think we can learn uh, a lot from those analogies from Totter. So I have spoken for too much. I've said nine skills that I think we once had that we choose not to use as much now. And I'm going to let the two, next two minutes let children explain, by their actions, getting adults to do things that adults really don't want to do, and we'll decide whether adults have fun and actually change things by doing it, and I think this epitomizes all nine things that I spoke about. <laughs> Are you going to die soon? Well, I hope you don't. 
So I think perhaps it's time to grow back up. You are still five years old, and I would say, is it? Can you, for the rest of the evening, just for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, and throughout this next week and few months, just look at the moon in a different way. Just ask an innocent question. Just talk to somebody who isn't your best friend and tell them you are your best friend and see what happens. Because I think we can, we can learn to connect with each other again. So I'm gonna leave with, um, with one last thing, which is really three little bits of research again that I found as I researched for the book. Um, the first was uh, research that Microsoft did in 2010. And uh, they discovered that in 2010, we across the world were walking 10% faster than we walked in 1990. Okay? So there's a number of us in this room that were here in 1990 and 2010, and that's us. So are we achieving 10% more? Are we 10% happier? Are we 10% more stressed? What are we doing with that 10%? Obviously, it's overlapped with the time that mobile phones and constant technology has come along. So I just leave it out there. That's the research that they found. The second thing was the British Council did research um, around about the same time that found that the, human, the average human attention span in the UK was eight seconds. We could concentrate on something without getting distracted for eight seconds, and then we get distracted and we still know about what was going on, but we wouldn't focus on it. And you know, traditionally the goldfish has got a nine second attention span. <laughs> but the worrying thing was it followed up on research they did some 15 or 20 years earlier that showed that human attention span was 12 seconds. So somehow in that intervening generation, we have lost a third of our ability to concentrate on something. Now, there's, that means we can multitask more, and there's lots of good things from that, but it does mean that if we've got deep-seated problems in our personal lives, or our business lives, or in our society, we are less likely to solve them. And the final, the final thing, um, and this sort of blew my mind, I had to go and check it up a few times, and that was National Geographic, I think it was, research, that, um, that, that showed that today, in a single day, like today, each of us will have been exposed to more information coming at us than our ancestors, our flesh and blood, did 500 years ago in their entire lifetimes. Information coming at us. Now, obviously, we don't absorb all that information that's coming at us. We don't absorb 1% of it, probably. But the temptation is there to do so, and to multitask, and to get stressed. And all of these things are happening at the same time. We've got mental wellness problems, we've got stress, we've got pressure, um, and we're, we're, we've got loneliness. 
And I just say, all of those things relate back to a simpler type of life. So working out what's important in our lives and focusing on that. And, and that's what we had when we were toddlers. We lived a simpler life in the same world. And I would say, the final, final thing that I would say is that um, you ask a toddler what's really important in life. <coughs> Why is life important? What's important? They will talk about kindness, and they will talk about love, and they will talk about family. You ask a bunch of adults, and they will not talk about those three things in the top five or six or seven. And somehow we think other things are important. And I think we would have a better life and a better country and a better society if we went back to that. So thank you for listening. Um, I have to say questions. I hope I've changed 1% of the way you might look at the world, uh, but I know I've given you a smile. Thank you very much. started around 1906, probably people will tell me better here, uh, with certain reforms that happened. And basically it was to get young boys educated to a certain level so they could go into the factories of the army and they could strip a gun and they could work a machine. And they taught them basic skills so that everyone came to, comes out at the same standard, basic maths and communication skills and that. And that system effectively hasn't changed, I don't think, in a century and a bit. We still ask children to sit down and do an exam and come out the same. Yet what we need in this country, in this society, is people coming out different. How can we encourage people to have these left-field ideas that no one thinks will work and they've got the confidence to see them through and we can support them to see them through? How can, in this next century certainly, teaching knowledge, as in facts and figures, is always going to lose to AI when we, when we come out of school and university. So how can we teach them creativity, critical thinking, communication skills, all those skills that actually, when we go out of this Fletcher Hall now, I'm fortunate enough to be knocked over by a bus. The empathy of the ambulance people is as important to our well-being as the skill of the nurse that then sees us in hospital, I think. So, as a country, we've got to look at that. Now, I'd ask Ofsted to go and look at Finland. Finland has traditionally had the best education system in the world. It comes on the top ranking all the time. What Finland has just done a bit earlier this year is to say that education system, although the best in the world, is not fit for the 21st century. We're going to relook at it. They've done a pilot in, in, uh, across the country whereby they don't teach by subject, they teach by, uh, by social skill, skill, uh, um, soft skill. 
They cover the same curriculum and they do it in a completely different way. Offset could learn from that, I think, because I think Finland, to, to be brave enough, to the bravery, to be able to do something like that when you know you're the best in the world, even in the future, uh, take some of doing so, they're pointing in that direction. More questions? Paul, oh, great job, really, really good job. Um, more of a reflection, actually. Um, have you been asked yet to keynote at any of the party political conferences? And if not, can you please try and get them all three, <laughs> if not four, um, and do what you've just done? I have done it with politicians, um, and they sort of played the game, and uh, the trouble, very <laughs> politicians. <laughs> the difficulty, so obviously I'm talking about certain skill sets that we can revisit. Really what I'm definitely not saying is act like a toddler and, and try to try act in the crowd and try to be the right way. And what we, what we, you know, there's, to me, it all comes back down to people. We've lost touch with each other. We've lost our business and our economy has lost touch with the fact that we're creating prosperity to do something positive for people with that. Our relationships are too insular and are not on their own. There's a whole other thing. And that is kind of a human agenda rather than a part of political agenda. And I think creating wealth to do something better with it, something if we don't do that soon, our capitalist system will soon crumble. Um, so I'd love to talk to them all if they're inviting. I remember the TED talk um, probably 10 years ago, uh, Sir Eric Robinson said that um, education was predicated on the industrial revolution and so the performing arts and so on were given a no uh, priority. But um, given that, how might you go about changing education? For example, uh, people coming out of universities, you know, seem to believe that they must get a certain quality of degree, mm -hmm. a certain range of subjects. Mm -hmm. We groom that daughters if you like mm -hmm. to achieve in that sense. Um, but if these are the things that confine the way we think, how might tertiary education, for example, um, bring back the range of creativity? Yeah. Um, I, I think universities are one of the last institutions in our country that are still trusted uh, universally. Um, and I think that brings a lot of responsibility. When I was privileged to get the honor to be here, the, the talk that I gave afterwards was about challenging the university, challenging the university as in the staff and the people here uh, that teach, uh, 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 to think more broadly than their job is to get people through a degree. Their job is to create adults that will look after our society for the next generation, in my view, and to be complete, um, complete contributors to society for the future. How can we best equip them? So involve them in the community. And, and things like human rights, of which I, I chair a, a, an organization for, is if we can encourage them to think about the small things and the small spaces that, that, that are human in their day-to-day -day interactions, and how they can contribute to civil society, how they can get their voice heard, how can they, they can speak truth to power, how they can be a ripple of hope for others by the actions that they take. That is where I challenge the university across the world to, um, in, to get away from, I'm going to get more money from the government or from research grants or whatever if I do excellence in academia. Obviously we need that, but also there's a responsibility for all of that. And I would tell the students, as I told them that day, um, to go down. And to, to not get fixated by the best, the point of the university degree is for you to get the best job. Obviously it is to get, it, it, it helps you get a job, but it helps you contribute and work out who you are and be challenged and fail. Now, um, I, I know there's some universities who are starting to do degrees where there's no exams in them, because exams are designed to pass and it's their degrees are about innovation, and innovation is about failure, learning, adapting. So there are workshops and it's evaluated as they go along. That's the, sort of, that's the sort of forward thinking that I think we need to think about what our universities are about. That last bastion of, of sort of trust in our society that, that is undiminished. Gosh, these are very grown up conversations. <laughs> well, good, because I haven't got a grown up question. Good. Hi, Paul. Hi. My name's Tatiana. I'm sitting one of your colleagues, by the way. Yes, I know. Back from Malaysia. And, and 
vice chancellor. I'm sorry. Vice president, vice vice, what are you vice? <laughs> you forgot to mention the staff that are here as well, so we can be staff. Um, anyway, Paul, uh, the not so adult question. So yeah. I think we just saw your 80, I hope I'm right in thinking that we just saw your 80% of what you do 80% of the time. Maybe you're a super person. What's your 20? I mean, what do I relax and do? How do I just get on with life? My 80 is um, very yeah. Lovely corporate person, but my 20 is a mum yeah. who likes to put on a you know, okay. cosmopolitan. I would say in time, uh, family, but the other way around is actually don't think about it in time. So, you know, my, my, my job is to help my children be the best people that they can be. So that's my 80%. That's why I do what I do. Um, but, uh, but that's not in terms of time. So, all of us, you know, I started a business from home. Uh, partially to be able to work from home, and then you work out, actually, I've got business here, and started to grow, and I'm going to have to make these compromises between not seeing my children for tea, which I thought I'd see all the time because I was at home, and actually getting stressed with one of my customers because they weren't paying me or something, or having to do with production. <coughs> um, and life is really stressful, isn't it? And I just go back inside me, myself, to that little boy, and say, what is really important here? And it's, so the work that I'm doing with my child obesity now in London um, is about how do we change behaviours when people change their behaviour, I'm, be, I'm an amateur here talking, I, I know there's going to be experts in the room, it's dangerous. Um, but, but the theory about how people change behaviour is about motivation, it's about opportunities, it's about capabilities. And those, we, we, we grab them at points of change in our lives. And it's easy for a day to day where everything's the same, we don't change. But when we have a baby or we get ill or we, have a, uh, uh, we suffer a bereavement, um, we, we really think about what's important. And I try to challenge myself constantly about what is important. And it's important today to come here, but if my mum had phoned up and said she was ill, I was not going to be here, obviously. And you've got to draw a line somewhere of where um, those lines are. So uh, I, I prefer not to think about life in time, because I'm less ahead than the others behind, I guess. But I, what can you do in that time, and what, how can you make a difference? Is the right Um, so, I think I'm convinced that we all need to spend more of our life feeling, acting, acting like a child, and thinking about that again. I guess my question is, if we're thinking about that, then what, have you got any practical tips for how we can remember to do that? So, we can all leave here today feeling like we've changed 1%, but other than dressing up in costume, which yeah. I'm not going to go that far, yeah. you know, what, is there anything that you can suggest that would just help us remember in those moments? to think differently? Um, I, I think out of all the things I've talked about, it's probably confidence. And I think, does it matter if someone thinks I'm an idiot by doing something? Does it matter if I'm wrong? And, and I, you know, confidence comes from within. And I painted a story of almost an idyllic childhood. Let's remember something that was happy. Some people in this room might not have a happy childhood. I'm very conscious of that, that, that we, we don't want to romanticize what we can what we've got inside us. But the, what we are is inside us. Who we are is inside us rather than a physical being. So that's how I um, try to look at it's self confidence that comes, uh, you know, I, I just stood on a stage like this when I was 25 and amazed by entrepreneurs that can start their businesses and things at that stage. Um, and I think it's those little things, it's the little wins, literally, it's those little things that we can change in our lives. When we see something that's wrong, and we turn a blind eye to it, by not standing up to it, the ability to stand up for it will, put, will give us a confidence and a, a self-worth more than, 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 uh, than not, but certainly more than a monetary award. Businesses, I think, often get confused or, or wrong in giving people monetary rewards all the time. But it might, a thank you, I noticed that. Sorry, you made that mistake. Let's learn from it. That sort of humanness, I think, are where the com companies with the best cultures and therefore the best financial results come from. And I think it's, it's self-confidence. It's patting each other on the back and being more, more recognizing of the, of the struggles that we all have as we trundle through life. Any further questions? Can we dance? I've <laughs> 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 got one over there and then one near the front. I say that we should also beware 
children learn from us. And if you watch the way a child will search his parent's face to catch the emotion as to what, whether it's been good or bad or what it wants. And I tell the story of a friend of ours once whose father had suffered from polio. And because of that, he stood in a certain twisted way. And the son grew that back up to his mid twenties as I knew him. So they do learn from us as well, and that's a tricky one. Well, no, you're absolutely right. I'm glad we're getting to, you know, I, I, I'm paid, I'm, I'm using analogies and, and, and to, to put things through. What I think you're getting at, uh, how I interpret it, is, is a little bit about role models in society. They're looking after role models, something they can learn from. And, you know, we've created a society where some people don't have those role models, whether they're break down in families or whether they're from uh, a, a disadvantaged community or something where they don't see where they can aspire to get to because those people aren't there, and that's a failing of our society, and we, we, we will be a better society, we'll be happier individuals if we can find those connections that are people we can learn from. It comes back to people again. People interacting with each other. My question is actually very similar to that, um, about role models, but also the way that you are brought up and that you might be sorted. It's very interesting when you ask people who their heroes are. So many people talk about their, their family and their, their, their media people, and other people will pick you know, Nelson and others or whatever. And, um, we're all different, we, but we need that sense of inspiration and, uh, and energy. And I, I, I just, we've all got extraordinary things within us. Every one of us, in many ways, will be ordinary. We're going to be no different to the other 8 billion or 7 billion of us that live on this planet. Yet we're all unique because we've got a unique story, we've got unique experiences, and we can have the confidence to use that in a new way. We, 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 we can, but those little, those, those little, little things that differentiate us are less than everything else that unites us. And again, I'm talking about our society all the time, but we focus on the differentiators rather than the uniters in political and business discourse. Um, if we thought like toddlers we, um, uh, and others, you know, so it's uh, uh, it's people. I guess I'm talking about people, just recognizing each other for who we are, warts and all. Final question. Good to you that. Hello. Yeah, it was a very interesting talk and for a long time while you were talking I was thinking that actually you know um, it's interesting when you talk about core values because I believe that our core values and last week I'm a lecturer here at university I was teaching about cross-cultural values and you know how you learn when you are a child and actually how those values guide you through your life and I do admire the fact that you're saying you know stick to your values and many times that means actually going against everyone else's values and sometimes you might be regarded as a, as a black sheep. So, you know, how do you, to some extent, stick to your values and <coughs> uh, still be aligned, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. with organizational mm -hmm. values and group values and mm -hmm. so forth. The second point is that when we talked about universities, and, you know, I have been teaching for 10 years now, and what I'm seeing is that students over time <coughs> are very focused on their final grade. So when I started teaching, I used to see that students were more focused on knowledge, on learning, on being creative, thinking differently, but nowadays is how can I get my first? So, you know, while I agree with everything that you say, I look at my students and actually, you know, when I ask them to be creative, they tend to think, how can I get my first? <laughs> so, the, those are two very different questions, but I, I wonder if you have any comments well, about it. So, we can, we, what you're sort of saying is, the world we live in is not the world we would like to live in, and there's a discourse between the two. 
uh, the world we live in is quite transactional in many respects, and we, we want to have a, a life built on values. My view is, it's the little things that we do, it's the little people that do extraordinary things that can create these ripples of hope that build waves. So the people that took to the streets in Egypt 10 years ago created something just from the mass down. As Joan of Arc did in France many years ago. There's, there's so many individuals that have no right to change things. I read a fantastic book recently about how the laws around slavery were, were changed in the UK. And it wasn't Wilberforce ultimately. He was the end product of ordinary people who got people to vote against their vested interests. They got petitions from hundreds of thousands of people in this country who couldn't read or write at that time to say, even though they were getting free sugar, it's wrong. And they, they managed to nudge people. So it's, I'm a huge believer in sort of the work that I do with the child obesity stuff in London. It's nudging. You know, we get, and my thing about creativity is little things that we can change and the culmination of those little things. So if we don't like the society that we live in now, very few of us are going to have the opportunity to stand on a platform and change it overnight. But many of us can come together and change it a little bit today, a little bit more tomorrow, and we will evolve things. And that's how everything evolves. And it can go the wrong way as well. So I'll, I'll end with, with a point about um, our economy and capitalism. And again. Because it's so easy to measure the success of a, com a company or a country by GDP, profitability. And that is one measure of many. I personally think, from a successful business person, I guess, that actually the money is the thing that oils the mission and actually delivers something that, that helps deliver the ultimate goal of, of helping people. But so we've got to this point where it's really simple and easy to measure wealth. And that's why we say it's a successful company. Britain is the fifth biggest economy in the world. Aren't we doing well? What we don't know from that, when capitalism first started back in the 1850s in the Industrial Revolution, they didn't measure, there was no such thing as GDP. They measured the success of a company, uh, country or a company through the wealth that was created in how that affected incarcerations and uh, illnesses and education for people. And, and over the next 50 or 70 years, that changed and narrowed down to money. Let's make money. Let's make money, let's do something with it, and let's measure our success against that. Because what we don't get if we start to measure the success of our GDP, we don't get the beauty of our landscapes, we don't get artists, we don't get strength of marriages increasing, we don't get our public debate from the discussions that we can have. All of that's irrelevant if all we focus on narrowly is, um, is GDP. And if we stop and think, we've got, eight, we've, got, we've got children who are 15 and asked to choose three subjects to go A-levels, and then 17 or 18, one subject to do at university, and one degree that might get them a job that they're expected, if they go to live to 100, they're expected to do for 50, 60, 70 years if they're going to live that long. That's not, that's not what, and they're going to lose the enjoyment and the discovery and the risk taking and the, the joy of finding other things. And I don't know what the answer is, but I think nudges help. Thank you. I'll, I'll have one final, final question there. Sorry. Um, okay, so just. Sorry. Um, I have so many ideas, like I'm so creative by nature, but I don't know how to go further with that. So I don't know how to, because I know I need a team, I know I need other people who can help me take my ideas further, but how do I be, how do I think in that trusting way? And no, it might be a bit of a loaded question. Well, no, so I'm answer in two ways without a direct answer. One is, I'm so glad you said, I need to find people. Because that's what you need to find. You don't need to find money, or if you need to find money, you've got to find people first to find money. Because a bank manager or an investor isn't going to invest in your business plan, whatever your idea is, they're going to invest in you and your ability to deliver it. So start with people and network and ask questions and put yourself out there and sort of connect to find people who know things about you. The second thing, and it's kind of almost a plant of, uh, in terms of, it gives me an opportunity to talk about something Robert. Uh, just talked about earlier, and that is um, this imagination ca uh, imagine campaign here at the university, and this idea we're doing called Imagine It, which is all about finding, I'm not going to guess you ordinary, extraordinary people with extraordinary ideas that are just ideas. And how can we use this university to help accelerate those ideas so that you can work them out as to whether they're feasible, they can be scalable, they've got a business or sustainable plan behind them or not. And in two, three weeks' time, we're opening up a competition to anyone around the world who wants to apply with an idea that can solve on the social development, the sustainable development goals. Uh, and if it can do good, you might be the person that wins seventy-five thousand pounds that can accelerate it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Before I... Well, 
Sometimes I can stretch the, uh, <laughs> the time. Uh, I just want, just want to say something about, about our students and our staff, and, and uh, I think the external pressures to perform, to get the first two well, on, to get the job, isn't it? It's very great. But I mean, I, I do spend a lot of time, you know, listening to talks by my colleagues, and I'm always uh, inspired by the amazing work that we um, yesterday at Hawkins as, and as climate change scientists who spent all this time, you know, presenting climate change in a way that people can understand it, sort of spirals and stripes. And it, and it, it is quite uh, empowering to listen to colleagues. And also as students, I, I do go out most years on that blackout night when, when a group of dedicated students goes out and turns the lights off of both academic buildings or, or student halls where students can be bothered to turn the lights off. And, you know, we have a great exercise here. Mm -hmm. You know, what's that all about? This is our students just living, imagining, mm -hmm. just as you say. And, and the questions are there. You can't, you know, when they sit in the lecture room, I think they want to be serious, they want to talk. But I think an awful lot of our students know, if you can play Quidditch and imagine that you've got a broomstick flying around, whilst you can obviously see that they're not, but they just feel like that. It's very fun to watch. So I just want to say that on behalf of the university. Paul, uh, an excellent, a wonderful presentation. I think I think um, I think clearly about I'm where to work these days. I think we we need to bring some of that creativity, and you can hear it from all sides. It is important sometimes to think as a toddler. Uh, maybe maybe sometimes behave like a toddler, not too much, please. Um, but I think more creativity and more more honesty is certainly always welcome. It's a good presentation. I know you will be in the foyer for a little bit, so I'm not going to lengthen it anymore. But ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to join me once more to thank Paul for this. Program.